Greetings, everybody. I am Young Penitent, and welcome to my Icon Corner. I have here with me today Brother Nathaniel, and I know that's who you are all here to see. So I am going to bring him on very shortly. First, I would like to say, like the stream. If you're new here, press subscribe because that's just what people do. And also share this stream. You can share it now or you can share it after the stream's done. And with that, here is Brother Nathaniel. Shalom, shalom aleichem. Aleichem, that's shalom. What, that's what Jesus said when he entered through the doors. He didn't open the door, he just walked through the doors. He says, shalom aleichem. He said it twice, peace be unto you. And then he said to Thomas, stick your hand here and don't be doubting anymore. Stick it in. <laughs> uh, so, brother, Very welcome. Great, you know? yes. Uh, welcome to the channel. And is it how's the sound, everybody? Just let us know. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, I'm glad. Thank you for coming. And uh, just for those who sure. have not seen the first interview, we interviewed Brother Nathaniel about. Oh, it was probably six months ago, maybe a year. And that is the most viewed uh, video on my channel. It's got up to 34,000 views at the present. And so we know that people want Brother Nathaniel. All know? right, let's do it, Danny. Come on. Let's do it. Okay, so um, first first of all, uh, I want to... Okay, so you, you are the Orthodox content creator that... Out of all the Orthodox content creators, you are the one who you show the faith to people who are not Orthodox the most. People who are watching you, they might not even know what, what Orthodoxy is. Okay, so they see you and you've got the black clothes on, you got this cross, you got this hat, right? So can you explain to us, for example, start, what is your clothing? Why are you dressed like that? What kind of hat is that? What's going on? I'm a tonsured monastic. I'm actually Father Nathaniel, because when you get tonsured in the Orthodox Church, I'm with a Russian Orthodox Church, or any Orthodox Church, when you're tonsured, they take a clip of your hair and they put it away in a very holy place. Then you become Father Nathaniel. I was in a monastery for 10 years, old calendar Greek, and now I'm with the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. It's called Rokor under Archbishop Kirill. And I am a monk, and I have a monastic prayer rule, and that's why I wear this. What is Orthodox Christianity? Orthodox Christianity is the church that Jesus Christ, our Lord, God, and Savior, established and the apostles built. It's the church that Jesus Christ is the head of, and I am a member. So somebody told me the other day, I don't need church. I just have the word. Well, if you just have the word, the word says that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and we are members of his body. So if you're not in the body, you're not connected to the head. Okay. And so the the head, you, you mentioned that you're in the Russian Orthodox Church and I am as well. We both, me and, me and you happen to be in the same diocese and under the same bishop. And so some people, they sometimes I see online that there is people are, are questioning whether you're really a monastic. OK. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to share a document that uh, our bishop has written. And this is going to affirm, confirm for us that that Brother Nathaniel is a monk and uh I will read it out for those who are listening on the podcast. So this here, we have the official letterhead from Archbishop Creole, and it says, to whom it may concern, this is to confirm that Brother Nathaniel is an Orthodox Christian, tonsured monastic, residing in the Western American Diocese of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Brother Nathaniel takes part of, part, partakes of the Holy Mysteries and continues to be a member in good standing of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. There is no objection to Brother Nathaniel receiving the Holy Mysteries in other Orthodox churches. Signed, Archbishop Kirill, 14 August 2023. This is a very recent document. And for those who are wondering, this is our venerable 
Uh, Rev, most Reverend Kirill, here's a picture of him. And mm -hmm. so uh, if I would like to ask you about this now. So what if people have questions, do you think they should, you know, what if people have doubts? Can they maybe go, where would they take those questions? Well, go to the Rokor Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, which is under the patriarch of Russia, Moscow and all Russia. And just ask any of the bishops. But first ask Archbishop Kirill, his emails there. They just say, is Brother Nathaniel under you? Then go to the chief hierarch, Nikolai, and ask him. Metropolitan Nikolai or Archbishop Gabriel, who tonsured me. So that's it. Here, so we don't, have to, we don't have to belabor the point. We really don't. Yeah. Because, Daniel, I get slander all over the place. Okay. That's why I wanted to. <laughs> Let me finish. In the book of Ecclesiasticus, the opening chapter says if you've come to serve God, be ready for temptation. Well, let's fast forward to today. If you've come to serve God, to preach the gospel, to expose the enemies of the gospel, get ready to be crushed. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of that. Let's move on. Well, what does he think? What does Archbishop Kirill think of your uh, ministry? I understand Stan, you had me. a I, mean, I love him. I mean, come on. I've been doing this since 2007. Okay. And the bishops and the priests, they 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 see what I'm doing. They, the Bible with brother was very popular, and I would get all kind of compliments because I read the Bible cover to cover 300 times, beginning when I was a Jewish kid in Shabbos school. We read the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Okay, okay. so there's no problem. Okay, right. okay. So we we've covered that. Now uh, my next question is, what happened? You up and disappeared from YouTube. You had a channel that was exploding. You went up to 50,000 subscribers in a year. So where'd you go? What happened? Well, it was uh, it was starting to go viral. I was getting a million views per month. I went through the monetization process, and they have to check you out. And they said, fine, the guy's fine. He's preaching the Bible. There's no hate. There's no... Uh, issues with you know a, a political view i was just preaching the bible because i got a blessing from archbishop Kirill to preach on the internet so i went for it and, and did it it was beautiful it was wonderful and i had a huge huge following mostly and we, there's analytics on youtube and i saw through the analytics i was reaching the age group 16 to 30. And they would write to me all the time, brother, you're so cool. I just like the way you talk. I like your delivery. I like you just get right to the point. It's not long-winded and you illustrate and you just have a knack for communicating. I'd like to become Orthodox. And Jews were writing to me too. And I'm now working with a Jewish guy right now who is a professional person in the business world who saw my videos and was convinced that orthodoxy was the way for him to move out of the synagogue into the Christian world through the Orthodox Church, which is very Hebraic. It's the right transition from the synagogue into, the, into uh, believing in Jesus. The Orthodox Church is so Hebraic. So I was doing great. It was wonderful. And every I checked all the boxes on monetization, and I was getting uh, 5000 a month coming in monetization because I was getting that many views. Bible okay. with brother on YouTube it was wonderful. I love doing it. It was just so exhilarating and inspiring and encouraging to me to get all this feedback from the young. We have to reach the young. That's the future of the of America. That's the future of the world, the young. Yeah, we loved your channel and it was the most probably the most shared uh, videos on social media that I would see. Oh, um, oh, I get right to the point. I mean, one of them, I'm not going to mention any names. He would put the title on and he would say, the title of this video is, well, we know that, man. You see, I was a salesman. I was a straight commission salesman. I was raised in the business world. My dad was a very successful businessman. We were, I was in the retail world. And I, I, and I studied Madison Avenue as, uh, as a teenager. 
you have to get right to the point, okay? Because people don't have a strong, a, a, um, people are impatient today. They just, what is it? Okay, so you see the title, start talking, man. Don't say the title is. I didn't do that. I just, boom, got right to it. And I made sure my analytics that people were watching from the beginning to the end. If I saw them going off halfway, which was rare, or three quarters, and I would look at my text again and said, that's why. Don't do that again, brother. <laughs> I'm going to read this comment just briefly because I like this comment. Uh, Brother, you are a national treasure, says Peter Traj. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. I want, I, want, I want to be a national treasure. You know, something happened recently at a monastery I was visiting. One of the younger monks, okay, he was in what we call a, a dokimos uh, or a pashlushnik in, in Russian, I mean, a novice, okay? was upset that I was getting famous or that I was famous. And he felt this is not monastic. <laughs> well, tell me, what is monastic? Are we going to put people in a box? Okay. So he was trying to put me in a box. And this is the worst thing because someone said at some point, I, I don't know where, okay, that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But I don't know who said it. Maybe Abraham Lincoln said it. So at any rate, uh, he was uh, upset. So he, he was saying this guy shouldn't be a monk and he should be this and get him out of here. So the abbot finally said, leave him alone. Let him be famous because if he's famous, he'll spread the gospel. <laughs> and you Thank had a God, we do have some priests. In the Orthodox Church, it got, we say in the Jewish, some sechel, okay? Some sense that don't go by the script. And that's deadly. <laughs> and this is not the letter kills. Somebody said it. Maybe George Washington said it. Uh, that's not the first time you have a, ch a channel lost, right? Because you're an OG in YouTube. You. <laughs> You had I'm a the most banned. Alex Jones says he's the most banned person. No, I am. <laughs> I've been now banned by are. 11. Well, well you but got we're banned. We're going to talk about, about orthodoxy in the faith today, not about, you know. You got else. banned from uh, Band. Uh, video, I believe. So that makes you the most banned person, I, I would say. No, no, I didn't get That's Alex Jones's channel. I didn't get banned from there because I was never on it. No. Oh. I've been okay. banned twice from YouTube. But the second time I come on to YouTube, it was just Bible, but that wasn't yeah. that wasn't kosher for them. And you know the because Bible. I was reaching the youth, and YouTube sees the youth as their province. Right. They want to reach the youth for the woke situation, for homosexuality, for transgenderism, for denying how God created you. That's what the YouTube wants. Now I come on and say that I didn't even talk about it that much. But I was reaching the youth to become Orthodox Christians, to become to join the church, to take the holy mysteries, to take the actual body and blood of Christ. And YouTube saw that because I would put up a video, and not like some of the other religious comment, uh, Orthodox commentators would get maybe 11 comments. Oh, this is so wonderful. Uh, well, they were, they were parishioners, okay? Of course I can say, huh. But me, wow, brother, I never heard this before. I mean, man, and you're so cool. Well, I want to be cool. I want to reach the youth. This is this is uh, merchandising. I mean, come on. Now I'll get attacked. Oh, this is a way. This isn't a way an Orthodox Christian should talk. Well, who says that? The cookie cutter people. <laughs> I'm there. And I go back to what Thomas Jefferson once said: "The letter kills, but the spirit gives life." I think he said it. Maybe it wasn't him. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so and you're can you be where can you be found now though? You uh you've moved your channel, so you had your channel shut down, but yeah, I shut down, yeah, they shut it down. Oh yeah. Okay, I, I was moving up uh some some of them been on since 2000 they had fifty thousand viewers or hits, clicks, views. I was only at it for a year and had fifty thousand, and I was starting to go viral. See, I put up a video called Why I Left Judaism, which is powerful. It's just my story, how I came out of the synagogue, traditional Judaism, and how I came out of that whole situation and how it led me to believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So what 
you what, what we saw on YouTube, this was going viral. Within a week, it was up to 100,000 views. Two weeks, 200,000 views. It kept on climbing. It was going to be at a million views. How I left Judaism, why I left Judaism, and Jews were responding to this, both positively and negatively. But that's fine. At least I'm getting a response. Like Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold. But you're cold and I'll spit you, or you're lukewarm and I'll spit you out. You see, I like it when they attack me and say, no, brother, that's wrong. Okay, at least I'm getting some kind of response. They're not being passive and they're not ignoring me. I don't want to be ignored. So YouTube saw that I was getting 3,000, 4,000 comments on my videos. That wasn't the only one. The other one was a myth of Judeo-Christian. The other one was I was rebuking and refuting rabbis all over the place, which is a cinch. That's no problem for me because I grew up in Judaism. I know the Tanakh backward and forward, and I know Talmud. Okay, so that's not a problem for me. And oh, did they give you? What no was the warning. reason? No. Well, <laughs> what was the reason? Well, you go back to the script. You see, people like scripts, not only in the secular world, but in the religious world too. And that's when it becomes deadly when it comes into the church. But we can talk about that later because there's a crisis in the Orthodox Church. There really right. is. We've lost Jesus and we've gone into a script. Okay, and we, I can talk for hours on that subject because I know the gospel back and forth, back and forth, and the New Testament I've read 300 times, cover to cover. I have almost the entire book of Romans memorized. Okay, so I go to, ready to put up another video, and I say, what? I can't post. What? I can't even put the title on. What? Oh, boom. We are sorry to inform you, Brother Nathaniel, but you have violated our community guidelines. <laughs> okay, so I appealed it. I said, this must be a algorithm glitch. You must have picked up the word Jewish or Jew because I'm talking about the Bible. And if you go to concordance and you look at the word Jew, it's three pages long. So it's an algorithm, which please put me back on. No, sir. This was not an algorithm glitch. Maybe I'm talking about Susan Wyshitsky, okay, who still runs YouTube. Oh, you violated our community guidelines. So I just wrote back, which one? You say guidelines. Name one. Oh, I get a response back. You violated our community guidelines. <laughs> okay, th this is an exercise in absolute futility. You have one more appeal, brother, but it's on chat. So now I got to talk to a robot, AI, okay? Okay, I thought I have to go through the process. So no one can say I didn't go through the process. And if I did, I could have been back on. I went through the process. Now I'm talking to a robot. I don't know if the robot's wearing a yamaki or not. Probably. So what happens? You, I said to the robot, which guideline? Just name one that I violated. Just one. You violated our community guidelines. That's the end of your appeal process. And because of the terms of service, whenever you violate a community guideline, you forfeit your monetization. YouTube stole $5,000 of my money. They stole it. I earned it. They stole it. Okay, that's the end of that, Daniel, because I don't want to okay. get you in trouble. Where can we watch your uh, videos now? Are they anywhere to be found? Well, uh, just a few of them. Because now that I was banned, okay, all of them are, I'm sorry, all of them. I'm trying to recollect my mind here because I'm memorizing Bible verses these days. 
All of them are at BibleWithBrother.com. Yeah. They're not on YouTube anymore. Okay. All right. That's where they're at. Now I oh, want to. Oh, they're actually on BitChute too. BitChute. Okay. Yeah. Um. Now I want to switch gears a little bit here. We interviewed before you before, and we were talking about your childhood, your upbringing in Judaism, and we right. got. In that interview, we got all the way up to the point where you said that you read the New Testament. So I yes, want to know what happened when you read the New Testament. And, okay, and what let me just give a little background. Okay, like Putin. Okay, when uh, when Tucker wants to get him right to the point, uh, uh, Putin gives a historical account of what led to the uh, military uh, operation. Okay, we all have a history. It's like. People say, oh, and, and even Tucker Carlson at first said, well, how is this relevant? Well, of course it's relevant. Let's say somebody gets divorced and you say, how did it happen? Oh, well, we went to the court. No, that's not what, what you do. You talk about how it led up to the, the divorce and that's what Putin did. So let me just give a little summary. If people can understand Putin, and, and I understand him very well because I know people who know him personally, my bishops, okay? So, and priests from Russia, okay? So, and some here who are in America. So at any rate, what happened was I wanted to learn about Jesus as a Jewish boy in my bar mitzvah class, okay? Mrs. Schechter would refuse to teach Christianity. She taught every religion under the sun, religions we never heard of in, in 1962. All right. So she wouldn't teach it. So I talked to the rabbi. I said, let's learn about it. And he starts spitting. Don't you ever use that name? And then he used a curse word that it's in the Talmud. May his name be wiped out forever. Okay, I, but that's that's a curse word, but it's in uh, Hebrew. It's actually Aramaic, to be quite frank with you, because it's in the Talmud. But at any rate, um, okay, so I'm forbidden. I, I can't even learn about it. And even my father, I like to brag about my father. I mean, there he closed his mind. And he was always known as an open-minded guy. He was anti-Zionist. My dad was a very strong Orthodox Jew. He was anti-Zionist, but... No, that's off limits. That's the red line. Believing in Jesus or even talking about him or trying to learn about him. Okay, that's a, that's a very short background, okay, to the history of this thing. So now I'm away from my parents. I'm away from the synagogue. I'm away from the whole Jewish thing in Pittsburgh where I grew up. And I studied with the Lubavitcher's Chabad house in Pittsburgh. I'm now in California in 1970. And I got a New Testament because I wanted to know about Jesus. And I read Matthew chapter one. I mean, that's the beginning of it. And I see these genealogies. Now, most people skip over chapter one, not me, because I was raised in this whole genealogical realm, this milieu of uh, the, the generation of generations. My mother traced our, our family tree back. Uh, 12 generations. So I was fascinated by this genealogy of the Messiah, Jesus. And we all knew that the genealogies of the tribes were gone under Hadrian in 135 AD. He destroyed them all completely. They're gone. Now I see, well, this traces in detail of Jesus being of the tribe of Judah and of the clan of David. I said, he's the Messiah, just from reading Matthew chapter one. <laughs> How many people convert by reading Matthew ch chapter one? Me, because I grew up in the Hebraic, Judaic realm, and I knew the Tanakh very well, because we studied it in Shabbos school, in Hebrew. Okay. And what happened after you read? I mean, did... Well, what happened after I read, I went to, a, 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 I want to, let me find out more. So, I, well, am I going to find out more about Jesus Christ? Not in the synagogue. So I went to a Baptist church, First Baptist Church of Van Nuys, a big, big church, huge. And I was in the evening and in God's providence, there was a whole group from the chosen people's ministry, which some of the people left that and started Jews for Jesus, Moish Rosen, who I was friends with. Okay, so at any rate, they're talking about all the prophecies in the Old Testament. I go, wow, I know these prophecies. I've heard it before. But 
it meant nothing to me. Yes, yes, this prophecies point to Jesus. Yes. Oh, I got so excited that Messiah would conquer death, that he would step on the snake, uh, uh, on the head of the snake, that he would come uh, 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 before the end of the um, uh, Judaic dynasty, uh, the dynasty of Judah. A star shall arise, a scepter shall not depart from Judah until the star shall arise, the star of Jacob. Uh, it was like a light bulb going off in my head. So I go up to him and says, wow. I'm Jewish, and yes, I want to believe in Jesus. So they helped me to understand more how to believe in Jesus, and they were very, very um, convincing to me that I have to be part of a church situation. But they said the best thing for you is to go to a messianic synagogue. It was called Rock of Israel. I'm inspector. Okay, it was a church type of environment, Protestant oriented, but with Jewish, you know, with, with a Jewish flavor to it, you know, and all that. Then yeah. that's where I went. And how long were you in that in that sect? Well, I, I, I'm not going to call it a sect. I'm not because uh, maybe for sentimental reasons, uh, let's just call it Protestant with Jewish trimmings. Let's call it that. Okay, it was very Protestant oriented, but we said, uh, Baruch Hashem be Yeshua HaMashiach. You know, we use Jewish words and we put a yarmulke on, and we had the tali. Mm -hmm. We had all the trimmings, but it was basically Protestant. So I ended up eventually calling, and I even told Moish Rosen that uh, the, the Jews for Jesus are basically Baptists with yarmulkes on. Okay, but that was after I, I started learning more and more because I was a pretty incisive, sharp kid okay right. I, I think it's for my dad all right so now you know i'm in this whole messianic jewish realm and messianic synagogues we called them and i was in this whole shtick if you want to call it a shtick but it's more than that it's really a, a social phenomenon that these jewish kids who came out of the hippie movement i could write a book about it but no one reads books anymore but i could who came out of the the, the hippie movement become believers in Jesus. And there were two major groups, the Jesus freaks and the Jews for Jesus and the Messianic synagogues. These are former hippies. All right, so now I'm in this whole realm, but I decided I'm not going to be a full-time missionary like Moish Rosen wanted me to be, to go out and hand out these broadsides. Jesus made me kosher. If you don't like being born, try being born again. You know, very clever. He was a, he was a great salesman, a great merchandising. I think he was a, kind of a genius, actually, Moish Rosen. All right, so I don't want to talk down on these people because they have done something that we're not seeing in the Orthodox Church. They go out and evangelize. Now, when I go out and evangelize because I hold up the cross, Oh my goodness, get out the script. Save yourself. <laughs> okay, I want to ask more, about I, this. I've had more problems from Orthodox priests than anybody. So ex I want you to explain when you when you mean just in case people don't know, you go out and evangelize. This is your street oh, yeah. evangelism. What and I have a brother from Archbishop Carrillo. He loves okay. it. And not only from Archbishop Carrillo, your bishop and my bishop. But when I joined Rocor in 2008 from Metropolitan Alarion, who I originally was under, and I got all kind of letters from him, too. And Metropolitan Nikolai, who, who is the successor to Metropolitan Alarion, a blessed memory, loves my street evangelism. But we got some people who are scripters. Right, they're basically, right. they're basically yeah. Baptists, Church of Nazarene, Protestants who have a robe on and a pectoral cross, and they think they're orthodox. They are not. Now, that's I the understand. problem. That's one of the crises we have in the orthodox church. We have a bunch of clergy who are Protestants and orthodox garb. And that's a problem. So I, I want to ask, isn't it possible? Is it possible if someone wanted to uh, fly you out to their city? Is isn't it true that you will do this where where people can offer to fly you out to their city and oh, you yeah. will? Well, somebody just offered to fly me out from uh, to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I get offers all the time, and I go because so, I'm there on median strips, and I hold up the cross. So you yeah. do it on median strips, absolutely. I do it right in the Jesus Christ deserves center stage. I'm right on a median strip traffic everywhere, pedestrians holding up the cross. Okay, so people say, well, aren't you afraid? No, 
I am not afraid. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. So I'll take center stage. So what I did when I started this street evangelism, because I have sepal, I have some sepal. I grew up Jewish. I went to a lawyer. I told him, I'm going, I want to hold up the cross on median strips. He says, you can do it. I went to the best lawyer, constitutional lawyer, constitutional lawyer, whatever you call him, okay? He says, yeah, you can do it. I says, well, or how? He says, well, you must pick a median strip wherever you go that has a crosswalk in front of you. You get it? I got it immediately. Do you get it, Daniel? Yes. Why that's legal? Because if somebody is walking, I'll answer for you. Because if somebody is walking across on a green light and the light changes red, he's on the median strip. Okay. If he keeps on walking, he'll get run over. There is no law. You can't be on a median strip. <laughs> gotcha. Got so, me? No, so I have no word. Tell me that. <laughs> So if somebody wants to do this, how do they get in touch with you to arrange for you to come to their city? Oh, this is a, this is a no brainer. Email me, bro, short for brother, bro, B-R-O, Nathaniel. Spell it with an I-E-L or an A-E-L, I have both. Bro, Nathaniel at yahoo.com. Okay. <laughs> And then they can and inquire. Me, and, but it's not just invite me. You have to pay. Right. It takes right. money. You probably. Okay. Do. People say you're always begging for money to do the street. Okay. Well, I wouldn't, but uh, we have United Airlines and they, they do charge. Right. Last time I checked, they charge. Maybe they, they do freebies now. I'm not sure. And if you stay at a hotel or if you want to eat. Yeah. I'm pretty sure a restaurant or a grocery store charges you. I could be wrong. Right. 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 So, you know, cover spent expenses and all that. Um, right. I mean, maybe I can get, maybe, I mean, I bet if we got enough people together, we could pool money at our parish and bring you to our Please, table. That, bring me. I'd this, love is to my main, this is my main ministry. Metropolitan mm -hmm. Delorean blessed me a long time ago. He took my cross and he, we prayed for a half hour when he awards the priest's crosses, a blessed memory. Let me tell you a story about Metropolitan Alarion. He Please was do. beautiful. He yes. was, I love him. I miss him. There was a big argument at church of a woman who was a very um, uh, huge contributor to the, to the church. She did everything. She cooked, whatever it was, clean, whatever it had to be, set up the church, whatever it had to be, she did it. But she decided at a point she wasn't going to wear the shawl, the, uh, the headdress. Why? I don't know. It didn't bother me, okay, but it did bother some. So they were complaining and murmuring behind her back, and she knew what they were doing, but she didn't care <laughs> because she was doing all the work there. All right, so they finally bring it up to Metropolitan Larian. Oh, she's wearing a shawl. She's a woman. Orthodoxy, he says, oh, you have to wear the shawl, woman. Huh? So he was so cool. He was cool as a cucumber. I love him. I still love him. May he pray for me. He said, well, there is a solution to this. Oh, and everyone got excited. Oh, what is it? What is it? He said, don't look at her. <laughs> Their jaws dropped. This was Metropolitan Lawrence. He knew how to handle all these kind of things. <laughs> so, so this is you explaining the letter of the law people versus out of the box people. This is this is kind of I've noticed a theme in our interviews so far. Uh, for those who are watching, what he's explaining is in the Orthodox Church, women wear head coverings. This is traditional, and there was a woman who decided not to, and they went to the Metropolitan, the first hierarch, the basically the top person in our rokor, and they said right. we want to make her do this, wear this shawl, and he, he said, don't look at her. Problem solved. It's just the way he said it. See, you can say something. You know, years ago, Jackie Mason, I saw him live, probably the greatest comedian of all times. Okay. He said, there's two ways to tell a joke. One is with bad timing and one with good timing. Timing is everything. Mm -hmm. In love, in war, in comedy, in interviews. It's everything. So you have to have the timing. So Metropolitan had the timing. I'll tell you another story. There was... A complaint in the Russian church with some priests 
that my scupa, we call it in Greek, because what this is actually Greek, my first monastery was Greek, okay? Uh, I was posing as an archbishop because archbishops wear a big cross that's silver or diamonds. Well, how is this? Thing? How is this? Is that diamonds? Okay, so I'm posing as an archbishop. So there was a big complaint about it. So again, with, you know, these ones with the long robes, you know, about long robes and all that kind of thing. And, you know, prayers in the marketplace, you know, Pharisees. Okay, so I can't wear that. I'm posing as an archbishop. <laughs> all of a sudden, a Metropolitan Alarion comes out. And I remember this. Uh, it was uh, at East 93rd and Park in Manhattan. That was my church for a long time. Now I'm under Carrillo in San Francisco. So now he comes out where everyone's ready to attack me. You're posing as an archbishop. You take the hat off. So they say it to Metropolitan Larian. He has this cross on, posing as an archbishop. So Metropolitan Larian, timing again is everything. He looks, kind of considers, he says, I like crosses. <laughs> Oh, do I miss him? Oh, yeah. I miss him. I actually have a story, a short story about him that I've told before. I don't know if you want to hear it, though. What do you think? Well, let's go on. I'm, I'm being interviewed. So yeah. Let's, okay. Let's go on. Um, so, okay. So you Jews for Jesus. You yes. you find these, you find this messianic group. And so I want to know, like, between that time when you first encountered Christianity and Christ until you became or before you become orthodox what is your journey I don't want to call it christianity because it's the church i found because christianity is abstract it's something in your head or something you read about or some dogma it's okay. the church i came into the church now right. the church was originally the baptist church but then i was encouraged to go to rock of israel messianic synagogue which was like it was it was a church but with jewish trimmings as i said and we had everything that most churches had we had a service and we had a holy communion but it was more it was a symbol so he had some matzah and some manischewitz wine but it was a symbol where you look back and weep that's not orthodoxy orthodoxy doesn't we look back and weep the manifestation of the blood and body that was crucified for us becomes our food, the risen body and blood. But we had all those things. So I came into the church, not necessarily Christianity, because I don't deal in abstractions. You see, Jews don't deal. I, who asked me about this? I think Alex Jones on my interview with him. And I forget what it was, okay? But I had to say, I don't deal. Jews don't deal in abstractions. They deal in actual physical things. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, were you, weren't you in several bodies, though? Um, not, not necessarily Christian... I mean, before okay, I started became... with the Rock of Israel, and then I, uh, but then I moved back to Pittsburgh and got a job, a high-powered straight commission sales job, which I had for 25 years. And I was with another Messianic synagogue. Then I was in Boston, and I was, I would say, three altogether: Rock of Israel, then one in Pittsburgh, then one in Boston. Okay, and how did but you? Then after the one in Boston, I realized that this is very Protestant. This is clap your hands, have a good time. And what was happening in the whole Messianic movement, there was a derogation of the divinity of Christ. If you keep on saying to try to reach Jews, which is the whole raison d'etre of these Messianic congregations, we have to reach Jews for Jesus. We have to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. So how do you do that? Jesus was a Jew. He's one of us. Jesus was a Jew. Everything about him was about being a Jew. So if you keep on saying that, you're going to lose the divinity. He's God, who, according to the biblical phrase, the biblical way of understanding Jesus, who came as the seed of David. That's the way you describe Jesus. 
Not that he was a Jew, because that mean that takes away from his divinity. He's God who took upon himself the full humanity of David through the Virgin Mary. That's how I understand Jesus. And I was now by that point in 1986 that I understood dogma pretty good. It wasn't orthodox dogma, but I understood dogma pretty good. And I said, I'm out of here because there was a denial by some of the leaders in the Messianic congregations that denied the divinity of Christ, which denied the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I said, I'm out of here. Okay. And I left it. And where did you go? Well, first I start, I went with to this high church Anglican. And it's fascinating, really. My journey it's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm amazed about it when I talk about it or think about it. I have a resume about three miles long. So where did I go? I went to the Church of the Advent. This is High Church Anglican that was started by the Oxford Movement. For those of you who study history, not too many these days. And if you want to talk about history, it's boring. And even Putin brought that up to Tucker says, I know this is boring, but it's important because this is what leads up to what we're doing now. And Tucker says, it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. We all have a history. We all have to say, what led you to? We're talking about my history right now. I need to get right to the point. So when Putin talks about it, all of a sudden, huh, it's boring. It's a drag. Let's get right to it. And Putin would not let Tucker do that. Well, Putin is my brother. He's my brother in the Orthodox Church, in the Russian Orthodox Church. We're blood brothers. We partake of the body and blood together. Okay, so now I go to the Church of the Advent. This is the Oxford Movement. Now, the Oxford Movement decided we have to take this Episcopal Church, this Anglican Church, and get back to our roots, which is the Latin Church. It's really a fascinating movement of the Oxford Movement. And if anybody reads the Nicene Father series, which a lot of people do, do you know that this was translated from the Greek by the Oxford Movement? But nobody knows this because nobody knows history. But history matters. Okay, so I go to the higher church Anglicans. Now I read the book called War and Peace. People say, how did you come to the Orthodox Church? I say, through Leo Tolstoy. And the scriptures, the cookie cutters, how is that possible? He was excommunicated. I said, I don't care what he was. He brought me into the church. You want to slander him? You want to trash him? I don't care. And may I see him in heaven. Because it was Leo Tolstoy that brought me into the church with his book, War and Peace. I can't stand this cookie cutter crap. It will kill you. Because somebody once said, maybe it was George Bush Sr. The letter kills bombs too, but the spirit gives life. Okay, so I'm reading War and Peace, and there's the most sublime passages about the church you ever read in your life. And the persons, and Princess Mary, and Natalia, oh my God, I just said, I have to find out about this. I thank Leo Tulsa, I hope he's in heaven, I intercede for him, I pray for him. The cookie cutters, the scriptures don't like that, because they're Protestants, they're not Orthodox. So now I go to an Orthodox church and I fell in love with it. And I, it's up on Twitter now. It's on X. You can see it on my channel, Real Bro Nat, My Jewish Journey into the Orthodox Church. Check it out. You'll okay. see how I was immediately, as a, 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 a man at this time, how old was I? 37, who grew up in the Hebrew liturgy, the synagogue. As soon as I walked in, I said, I feel like I'm in the temple of the Old Testament. It's so Hebraic. I'm home. Instantly. <laughs> I get chills just thinking about it. I want to cry. What year was that and when you... Thanks to Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's really no bad reason to join the church, you know? Well, what should there be? Right. I did a short on this. Uh, you know, this church could be wrong and the Orthodox Church, it could be wrong. Is there something wrong? Nothing. <laughs> it was a 30 second short. It was my most popular short. <laughs> it wasn't even 30 seconds. I think it was 10 seconds. 
I did all kind of really neat things. I, YouTube killed it, like the cookie cutter. It's a pill. You say something beautiful. You reach out to people. You do something maybe different to try to reach people. They'll kill you. And I so can't you tell you. I can't even begin to tell you since I started Street Evangelist in 2005. The persecution I've gotten from priests and Orthodox cookie cutters. Anybody else would have left this church, Daniel. They would have left. But because I see the church as a church militant, the church triumphant, that's over generations. And I understand that others, not that I'm going to compare myself to St. Maximus or St. Chrysostom or any of those who've been persecuted for the faith, okay? Uh, or St. Gregory Palamas, I don't compare myself with them. But I feel a little bit of a, uh, a bond with them because they were attacked too. Athanasius the Great, he was attacked by many Orthodox bishops because he defied Arianism. So I feel a bit of a bond, and maybe it's a good thing for me. Those cookie cutters, right? I can't. I can't, I can't stand the cookie cutter. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. So Let's talk about positive. Okay. I, so you found the church. I found and, the church. Yes. And I would like to know. Okay, tell me your story from finding the church, entering the church, and then finding monasticism. Okay, well, what happened? I was reaching the end of my sales career, been there, done that kind of a thing. I was a six-figure man, but I was a six-figure man when it counted in the 70s and 80s. It doesn't really mean much anymore to be a six-figure man, okay? You have to be um, a 12-figure man, okay, now, to make ends meet, you know. All right, so to have a family, it's almost, it's almost impossible now. But back then, I was a highly successful salesman, straight commission. Okay, the sale isn't made until the check clears, then you get paid. Okay, so at any rate, I was reaching the end of my career and I was in orthodoxy and I became very fascinated by the whole idea of being quiet. Because when you're a salesman, nah, 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 and you have to sell, okay? Yeah. And it's a skill, but it's actually not that you're manipulating or you're making somebody do something they don't want to do because they have a good product, you believe in it. You just have to know how to present it. Now, we have a great product, the Orthodox Church. We have a wonderful Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Okay, wonderful. Well, in today's age where this is looked upon as stale, archaic, something of the past, you have to know how to present it. Okay, you have to give it kind of a little pizzazz. Right. But I would do that, and I got attacked by the cookie cutters, okay? But I'm, I don't want to be negative anymore. Okay, so at any rate, I want to be quiet because I'm talking on, all right? I want to be quiet, so I joined a monastery. Old counter Greek. Oh, yeah. And we had long services. I learned how to stand in church, and I learned the services, vigils, and uh the uh, Traparias and the lives of the saints was wonderful. I was in uh, two monasteries, Old Counter Greek, and then a Russian, okay? 10 years altogether. And at the dining hall, we call it Trapeza, I would hear two readings a day at the church fathers. So that's why immediately Archbishop Creel blessed me to teach on Bible with brother, because he knew that not only did I know Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant, that I knew patristics, the church fathers. He knew that. Because if you're in a monastery for 10 years and you hear it twice a day, the church fathers, and then you, I became the reader for the last two years, you know the church fathers. Right. So you don't really understand the Bible until you read the church fathers who had purified their souls to the point that they could understand it. And even St. John Chrysostom had St. Paul teaching him the epistles. You want to understand the book of Romans 9 through 11? You go to Chrysostom. Then you'll understand it because St. Paul taught him. There's even an icon of him, the hook nosed St. Paul, looking very Hebraic, very Jewish, leaning over him, whispering in his ear. How to understand Romans 9, 10, 11? Right. I read it maybe 20 times, just those three chapters to understand. 
So people people might not understand you are such a treasure because of you 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 know the Bible backwards and forwards. You know what is it, like for example? Could you share your reading your reading rule? What how what do you read every day and you're part of your rule? Well, it's important for me to read the church fathers because you get the most profound things from them. And I, I met a young lady recently on, on the bus in San Francisco, and she was a, attracted to the way I was looking. And we took out to talk, and she was in her 20s, and she wanted to be a journalist. And she was in her last year at uh, UCAL Berkeley. And she asked me uh, what I read. I say, I read the church fathers. Well, what's that? She didn't have a clue, okay? So I said to her, look, here's what I would suggest to you. You want to read the most profound journalism of a communication. Read the letters of St. Basil the Great. You just go online, put St. Basil the Great letters. They're short letters. They're not long letters. Because here's a man from the fourth century who wanted to communicate his thoughts, his ideas, not always on religion, but on other matters too. And you will learn how to communicate in the most profound way, in the most concise way. And she thanked me. I hope she does it. Because reading the Church Brothers has helped me, too, to communicate. All right. This is a surprise question. Uh, you have your channel was Bible with Brother. You know the Bible very well. And so I know that you read the prophets. You're into the prophets. Oh, yeah. I would yeah. like if you could. What have you been reading in the prophets recently? And can you tell us? what you, your reflections, your thoughts have been on what you have been reading recently. Any insight that you could give us? This is my surprise. Yeah, well, you see, uh, most people don't know the prophets. I once quoted to somebody uh, who I knew didn't like me, thought I was harsh, and sometimes I use language I shouldn't use. Because sometimes there's this word that just gets it, okay? I don't use it often, but sometimes that word gets it. All right, so I knew that about that person, and we started talking, and I quoted something from uh, Isaiah. I didn't tell him where. He says, yeah, there you go again. I said, what do you mean? Yeah, your bad language, clean out your mouth. I said, are you talking about Yeshia? All right, I said, Yeshia, you didn't know what I was talking about. It's some Protestant and an Orthodox. Okay. <laughs> the prophet Isaiah. Well, what about him? I just quoted from him. You see, I was raised in the prophets, beginning at the Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms Jesus told on the road to Emmaus. He described to them the Messiah, what the, the, what the Messiah would do. He was saying Tanakh, because as a Jew, you pick this up immediately, the Jewishness, the Hebraism of the New Testament. It's just natural to someone like me who grew up in it. So... The prophets can use very harsh language, and you could almost call it X-rated. Growing up Jewish in our Shabbat school, we were forbidden to read the prophet Yehezkiel, Ezekiel. We were forbidden because of the language in it. It's X-rated in Hebrew and in English, too. Yes, it is. We are forbidden to read it, but Jewish kids, you know, we're going to read it. You tell a, Jew, a kid not to do something, he's going to do it. So we all got together one day, you know, over uh, a friend of mine's house, Mendel's, and we read it, okay, in Hebrew. Ah, moo. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. So the prophets can be very guttural, and they can be very graphic, and they could hit hard. I was raised in it. So people say, well, we shouldn't talk that way. I said, well, you don't read the prophets. But the prophets today, oh my goodness, the way they would rebuke kings and princes and leaders. Oh, we need a prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos today to hit Biden between the eyes. And Schumer and Noodleman, we need prophets to do it. It's relevant today if we had them, but everyone is scared. I'm not scared to stand up for Jesus Christ. He is being slandered. He's being blasphemy. There's so much blasphemy against the church, against Jesus Christ on YouTube. Nothing happens to them. 
nothing. I come along, I'm not blaspheming anybody. I'm trying to promote the church in a very cool way. <laughs> but the prophets are relevant today. We just need more prophets. Yes, we do. We have some in our church. We do. Unfortunately, they are in Greece who speak up. They're strong. They're tough. And we have them in Russia, too. And some of them have been martyred. Yeah. I think we need more in America. I really do. Which can get us to what we were talking about before, the crisis in the Orthodox Church, if you want. But you're the one who's hosting this, Daniel. Well, I'm, okay. That's, I'm going to get to that. But I want first, um, you know, we did a, okay, I want a lesson from the prophets. How about... I remember there was a lesson you were talking about once before, and there's a prophet who married a harlot. What does this mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Well, this was figurative. Of, this was, it was figurative to God's marriage to a harlot, Israel. That's that's what it is. This is a no-brainer. This is this is not a hard one to figure out. We read this as kids, and we figured it out immediately. This is not anything complex. But I think I want to get to Jesus. Okay. Now, what a lot of people don't know about Jesus, which I saw immediately, is his Jewishness. It was wonderful. I, mean, I was so attracted to him that I said to him, get that rabbi who spit. Get him, Jesus. But the thing about Jesus that just I, I was so attracted to, he did carry a cookie cutter. And a lot of people, they don't see this. He treated everybody differently. He didn't get at the cookie cutter, Kr, save yourself. <laughs> that's all you hear. So they read, they read Saint Seraphim, save yourself. And that's all they talk about, save yourself. Well, are you saving yourself? No, he's watching, they're watching Netflix or Columbo or some TV program. They're not saving yourself. So if you try to save somebody, if you try to preach, save yourself, okay? But Jesus did not do that. He treated everybody differently. Everybody was unique. So one, he says to him, sell everything. He was very wealthy, sell it all. But then another very wealthy man, very wealthy, a little short guy that had climbed a tree. What did he say to him? Give a fifth. <laughs> I saw this right away. I said, this is beautiful. He's not treating it. And everyone, he says, uh, let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me. Another one says, no, go home. Tell people about me. Everybody was different. And see, in our Orthodox Church, we have we have uh, Yerandas or Staritsis. In uh, Russian and Greek, it's Yerandas. These are, Yeranda means high, very high. So uh, it's like the Hebrew Zahan, okay? It's a high person who has reached the heights and they are able to see a person's soul their whole lives, really. I know some that I've come in and they knew my whole life, okay? Or, and they also know a person's destiny. They don't <coughs> save yourself. They don't do that. They see the person's destiny, but they also see God's providence in their life. So they don't, a true Yerenda, a true spiritual father in the Orthodox Church, a true counselor, is not one size fits all. Jesus was not one size fits all. This is a very Hebraic thing. Okay, a lot of people want to criticize Judaism, and I, I, I do, okay? But there was something that we had. It was like maybe, maybe called panache that we saw things differently. We saw things uniquely. We saw things according to a circumstance, according to what went before a history, like Putin wanted to show Tucker. There's a history here. We saw that. That's why I, I can groove into the Russians because they see things through the lens of history. This is a very Russian thing that Putin did with Tucker, very Russian, because Russians have a history a very complex history, some of it tragic, some of it triumphant. America's only been around two, three hundred years. We don't have that kind of history. All right, now it's time to get to the crisis in the Orthodox Church. I understand that you believe there to be a crisis in the Orthodox Church. 
Yeah, before I do, you know, I was thinking before this, you know, I, I always like to bring things home practically, how we can make our lives better. And there, I want to bring the message of Jesus, how we can make our lives better. And that is, let's try to be human. Jesus was very human. And he knew human beings because he wouldn't commit himself to all human beings because, as the gospel says, he knew what was in them. But some human beings, he did commit everything, everything. So I would say to those who are more mature to make their lives better, get involved with people. Don't just be thinking of saving yourself, okay? Which is for a few, like St. Seraphim. We're not all St. Seraphim. We're not. We're not. We're out in the world. I'm out in the world now. Think of who you can impact their life, but don't have a cookie cutter. And it doesn't have to be religious or Bible verses. Just appreciate the person. I once did this re reputation of Jordan Peterson. He says, sit on your bed and think of the things you're doing wrong. And I says, no, don't do that. Think of the things when you're quiet of the things you're doing right <laughs> and build on that. And whatever you're doing wrong will fall by the wayside. So what we can do to make our lives better, even if you're not all that mature in the faith, because it will mature you. I'm 73 years old. I've been around. Okay. Look for somebody that you like, that you feel like I'd like to have some impact on that person's life. That's how your faith, your love for Jesus can better your own life all right we will be getting to the questions the super chats uh at the end of the interview so thank you to those who have sent them in and yeah, you know, i'd like you to put that letter up again for those who have come in in the middle here all right adding that now in case you missed it at the beginning this is the letter uh, from Archbishop Creel, and this is proof. This just is from August 14th, 2023, a very recent letter. And it is just stating that Brother Nathaniel is a monastic in the Russian church abroad. He is communing the holy mysteries. And so let those who slander Brother Nathaniel be put to silence. Oh, yeah, yeah, it says I'm a monastic, and I had the letter from Metropolitan Alarion since 2008 when I joined Rocor, and I would put it up on my Brother Nathaniel Foundation every year. So it's up there, it's up there, it's up there. Here's a funny story with kind of a, like a subtle twist. I was lining up for Holy Communion at a big cathedral in Washington, D.C., and Father Victor Potapov gave me Holy Communion, a protapper took. There was a visiting deacon, a convert from the Protestant church. And as I'm walking back from the Holy Cup, he says, aren't you excommunicated? I saw on the internet that you're excommunicated. I said, deacon, you better tell the priest. He goes, what? He just gave me Holy Communion. You better tell the priest that he gave Holy Communion to someone who's that communicated. Go now and tell him. He didn't know whether he was coming or going because there's a little bit of a paradoxical type of uh, answer, which Jesus used many times. I will ask you one question. St. John the Baptist, was his authority from heaven or men? <laughs> he stumped them. Well, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why did you believe him? Because he predicted me or spoke of me. If we say of men, the people will stone us. So they said to Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> See, the irony, the paradoxes, they're all over the Bible. They're in St. Paul. They're in St. Peter. They're in Jesus. But we have people that are so obtuse that they don't see it. And they become very pharisaical and they go into the letter of the law, even with the gospel. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that to Jesus, please. So
So would you like to talk about the crisis in the Orthodox Church or should we move to Super Chats? Let's move to, um, do you have questions and answers? Let's go to that. We have five. I'll say one more thing. We need leadership in the Orthodox Church. Young leadership. Fresh faces. Fresh people who are not going to do the script. That's what we need in the Orthodox Church. And we need to start emphasizing the church fathers. We have to start reading the church fathers. Okay. Okay. Also, Just start um, with St. Athanasius the Great on the incarnation of the word. Just start with that. It's basic, but it's probably the most profound reading you'll ever read. C.S. Lewis would tell his students at Oxford, just for the purpose of literature, read this. Because St. Athanasius the Great got it. Short, abrupt, quick sentences. It's easy to read, but it's powerful. And here, here's an interesting story between uh, Arius, the heretic, and St. Athanasius the Great. And I've done a lot of study on this. And of course, I was in a monastery for 10 years and heard it. Our Arius was a heretic, but he looked the part. He looked very orthodox. He was very tall. He was six foot four, 75 years old, very venerable looking, skinny, very ascetic, very serious looking, never smiled. Oh, and the nuns, oh, he had 700 nuns following him. Oh, he looks so orthodox. Now he has St. Athanasius the Great that challenged him, defied him, exposed him as a heretic. He was short, okay, kind of bent over. Not all that great looking, but he was a powerhouse. <laughs> I love it. I just love these kind of things. It just does a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. We want to hear more. People, there's a, uh, quite an appetite for for the, these uh, these teachings from you, brother, because you have... Yeah, well, maybe Bible with Brother will come back on Twitter. We'll see. At least right now I have like a free platform. Let's see how long that, that lasts. Yeah. I mean, you do reach out to the non-Orthodox, but Orthodox want to hear that kind of thing. That's... They That's need to hear it. They need to hear it in a fresh way, but they don't have to hear it from me. New leaders, well, we, come on. We want to hear it from you. Can, you all, just online. Jordanville has, has an online seminary now. You don't have to go, to, go there. Do it online. We get want, your credentials and, and, and get, get a parish. We okay? want it from you. We want to hear it from you, brother, because okay. you have you understand the, the Hebraic. Well, I have you know, no we'll talk more. Okay, but let's do what we're going to do, Q&A. Yeah. Um, Yes. Do you want to talk about your, uh, did you want to talk about what you're trying to set up a media? Um, yeah, I do want to, I do want to talk about that. I've been banned so many times and I get hit so many times. You can't say this, you can't say that. So very recently, Alex Jones, who I do like as a person, I do. Okay. Sometimes I hear him for 20 minutes and I say to myself, what did he say? But he says it strongly, whatever it is he says, but at any rate, we were there. On an hour-long interview, he gave me a voice. He interrupted here and there, but that's just how it is on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. That didn't bother me at all. But he gave me a voice, and he did say that he'd been watching my videos for 15 years. So I said to myself, when he said that, he said, I'm sure he agrees with me, but he's got his constraints. Okay, that's fine. I understand human beings pretty good. All right, I was a sailor for 25 years. So at any rate, I decided this went real big. People loved it. Then Stu Peters, also very big had me on right after that. And wow, this is going big. So I decided I'd like to start my own studio that would be comparable in some way, not in competition to InfoWars or the Stu Peters Network. It would be my own niche, my own style, my own man manner, you know, my own stick, okay? And so I want to set this up. So people want to help me with that. It's not cheap to do this. I mean, look at Alex Jones' setup. Look at Stu Peters' network setup. Look at his setup. It's this is cost money. Okay. Right. So that's what I want to do. I want to have my own studio, my own Stu Peters network, my own Infowars type of thing, and I want to change internet culture. I want to dissolve the stigma of what you can say into what will now be socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. I think I'm the one that can do it, but yeah. I need my own studio. I need my own internet infrastructure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Brother Nathaniel is the one that can change internet culture forever. I can do it because I know branding. I know merchandising. I know marketing. This is the whole milieu I grew up in. And I know the Bible. And the Bible is so fulsome of different ways, different manners. If you read the prophets, they were all different. They had the same strong message of come back to God, but they did it in a different way. There was a different brand. And the main thing is, is that I have Jesus Christ. I have God. He has proven himself to me so many times that he is with me. Among so many adversarial scenarios since I started my ministry in 2005 with cops, with orthodox, with priests, never with bishops. That's a whole different scene because bishops are involved with a lot of people, with a lot of scenarios, with a lot of different settings. They get right. hit here. They get hit there. They're a hero today. The next moment, they're a bum. At the same time, they're a hero and they're a bum. I have no problems with bishops. They love me. But some, that's it. I don't want to be negative. Right. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll go for that. We will start going through the super chats. Uh, Felipe sends <laughs> 1090 Heyal, I think. that what is what that is. Um, from Brazil, I believe, and he asks, did Jesus really exist? Is he really God? Well, look, you just read the book of Luke, and you're not going to see this in the Quran. You're not going to see geography. You're not going to see names, leaders, a province here, the name of the province, the name of the leader of this province, when it happened, between what dates. It's self-verifying. The New Testament is just self-verifying. It's divine, yes. But with all these details of geography, which you're not going to get in any other religious book, it's not in the Quran. You don't have all these geographical locations and all these historical figures, which can be verified. Then that's the whole setting that St. Luke sets up. And of course, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, but differently. But Luke really nails it into a very strong historical set, uh, a setting. As is Jesus God, of course he's God. Only God can fulfill the first prophecy of what Mashiach would do. Now, when I say Mashiach, uh, that's from my Jewish background, Messiah can do. The seed that would come from Eve, and I'm not going to get real too dogmatic here, okay? That he would crush the head of the, sa of, 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 of the snake that brought in death. He would put an end to death. Well, only God can do that, but only a human being who represents human, human uh, humanity. So there you have the incarnation in Berachat 3.15, Genesis 3.15, okay? So only God can atone for our sins, bear our sins. Only God can crush the head of the serpent. Only God can conquer death, but he has to do it in his humanity to bear the death for us in his humanity because God can't die. Next question. Uh, okay, next I will go on to the next. But I would also like to add that um, that G the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is, in fact, not just in the Bible, but there are historical records. For example, letters from emperors of the Roman Empire talking about this yeah. fact. So it's pretty. It's okay, not. How could, how could twelve men that were scared to death hiding from the Jews for fear of the Jews for fear of the Jews? They're hiding. They're scared. What one of them uh, before a little girl said, "I don't know him." That was Peter. OK, remember that one? The maiden says, you're one of them. Says, no, not me. I don't know the man. OK, they're scared to death. They're cowards. All of a sudden, ha! you crucified him. Well, we did it. What should we do? Repent, and be baptized. All of a sudden, these men become so brave mm -hmm. and they go out and they say, what is it better to obey you or to obey God? Not if the Jews, they said that. That's proof of the resurrection. Now, who, who says that? Well, brother, you're speaking for yourself. Chrysostom, the greatest. St. John Chrysostom is the greatest. I grew up in music, okay? I played the piano. I studied uh, composition at New England Conservatory of Music. I have a long resume, okay? And they once asked Rossini, who's the greatest composer? Oh, that's easy. Mozart. 
but Beethoven's the only one. I say the same thing. Well, who's the greatest father? Oh, that's easy. St. Basil, St. Cyril, Jerusalem. But Chrysostom's the only one. <laughs> it's true. St. Gregory Paul must love Chrysostom. <laughs> he said the same thing. Okay, the, um, by the way, thank you, Felipe, for that. Uh, thank you to Black Ortho Acolyte, $5. And he writes, who do you think street evangelism is appropriate for at the parish level? Should priests themselves engage in it like <laughs> Father Daniel Sisoa did? The laity? Okay, don't get me on priests again. Okay, don't get me on that. The lady can do it, and why not? Okay, because there were two others that the um, a holy uh, Yerinda from uh, Greece told me about. That there was a, a Greek fellow who used to walk in Athens, the streets of Athens, with a big crucifix, and he just had that style. He had the timing, he had the look, and he would just hold that and just say, "Repent, repent." But he did it in such a way that wasn't condemning. It was like maybe kind of a novelty, something unique, something that uh, the Pharisees would not like. But he was very effective, this, this holy year that told me that I, that I met who was visiting uh, the, country, the United States uh, for a short visit. He told me about him, okay? So there are others who are doing it, and there is a young lady who does it. Uh, where does she do this? I think in Albuquerque. And someone told me about her, and she has done it like me. She has a, a, a beautiful Orthodox crucifix that doesn't show Jesus as a corpse. It's different, okay? And uh, she does it. So if you feel led, if you feel called, and you talk to your spiritual father, if you have the right spiritual father, then, yeah, if you feel led, you want to do this. But there's different ways of doing evangelism. You can hand out booklets. You can set up a table somewhere. Uh, if you go see a lawyer and make sure that you're not going to have problems. Because most police don't know the law, I, I found out, okay, for my street mm -hmm. evangelism. They don't know the law. They just want to show their muscle and all that. Then I show them the law and everything, and then they back off most of the time. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that question. Next question. Next. From uh, Slow Boy Whiteboard, who sends five dollars. Thank you for that. Thank Ask you. Ask our yeah. brother when he may write his autobiography, please. It is highly anticipated and very needed. Glory to God. Yeah, books don't sell anymore. I forget books. I don't know if I do a book. I mean, Borders closed. Uh, Barnes and Noble is about to go bankrupt. The books are over. The internet has it's going to change newspapers in five years there won't be any more newspaper printing so we have to keep up with the time so i do videos well youtube banned me but i'll have opportunities again this is why the studio the brother nathaniel show that doesn't sound too monastic i don't care i want to reach people for jesus that's what i care about this can be my venue to Put up my videos, why I left Judaism, how I left Judaism, what I did after I left Judaism, how I came into the Orthodox Church, my thoughts on the Hebraisms in the Orthodox Church. I can do all kinds of things with this studio, and no one's going to put a gag in my mouth. No one's going to say, in fine line, because I'll have my own guidelines. Right. And I'm not going to tell myself that I violated my own guidelines, unless I mess up and do something that loses my reach. That's what I'm concerned about. I don't want to lose the reach. Okay. Another, another question? Good question, by the way. Uh, uh, again, very... Felipe. Um, hey, Ice, 27.9. Uh, and he, thank you for that. He asks, according to the prophecy of Job in the Talmud, is Christendom, the Leviathan, and Islam, the behemoth, and end times? Will Jews thrive upon both? I don't see that in the book of Job. All, all God is talking about uh, his powerful creation. And ask Job, uh, can you do what I do? Are you going to question me? That's all that is. So it's, it has, Job has nothing to do with it. Okay. So is Chrysostom the Leviathan? It is no. Chris, I mean, Chris the Talmud can say all kinds of things. They say all, all kinds of horrible things if you read it in Aramaic. 
which I did when I studied with a Chabad, with Lubavitchers, because it was not written in Hebrew, and the translation in the English is sterilized. You're not going to see what I saw in Aramaic, because it was written in Aramaic. And I didn't see this in the Talmud. Maybe it's there somewhere, but who cares? Who cares what the Talmud says? It's just weird and strange. It's just full of all kind of minutia. How to say the bracha on this day? You say the bracha this way on that day. I mean, we don't need it. Forget the Talmud. It's not biblical. It's not the religion of the Hebrews of the Tanakh. It's not. It's a made-up religion in reaction to Jesus as the Messiah. It's the tradition of the elders which Jesus condemned. Mm. You have the tradition of the elders which nullifies. The word of God. That's what Talmud is in a nutshell. We don't have to be complex. We don't have to write a book about it. You see, that's what I loved about Jesus. And St. Paul and St. Peter and St. Jude. All of them. They just get right to it. We don't need long books. And You know, a, a wonderful person who was a spiritual child of St. John Maximovich. Father, uh, our arch mitre, uh, mitre uh, priest, wonderful priest. George Laren, Russian. He held the staff for St. John Maximovich in China. He said to me, brother, I don't read contemporary theologians. I read the fathers, and I recommend you do the same. He said, if there is anything contemporary you should read, it would be Alfred Edersheim, the Episcopalian, an Anglican, a former rabbi, who wrote The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. It's a masterpiece. It's not written by Orthodox, and some say, I won't read it. <sighs> Watches the news every night, but then he's not going to read. Right. Cookie cutters. Yeah, I had a, a bishop I once spoke with. The bishops loved me. He said, you know, brother, it's interesting. I watch your videos. I really like them. you got so much to say. He said, when I was ordained, and he told me who it was, very holy man. He said, uh, he, after the ordination in a big dining hall, and he's Called him over, says, as I assign you to this uh, the parish life, he didn't yet. Keep in mind one thing as you begin your pastoral career. He's waiting for something really profound. He's a holy man. What's that, good uh, master? He says, uh, just keep in mind that most people are morons. <laughs> oh my. I just run across this constantly, and it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. Yeah, my spiritual father told me something similar. Okay, uh, next question from Tina. She says, thank you, $5 chat. She says, Brother Nathaniel, give us a suggestion how we may, how we individually and as a church can proclaim the gospel better to help orthodoxy not be such a secret. Lord bless. Well, here's what I would suggest, and I wanted to do this, and it was shut down. I said, look, you see, I, I live uh, in a, a very uh, conservative area, okay? I says, look, I see Jehovah's Witnesses. I see Mormons going door to door, and everyone invites them in because that's kind of, you know, area men. Rural, conservative. Let's do that. Let's get a real nice looking booklet and let's knock on doors. I'll, I'll go and would, someone else can come with me. Probably a woman, so it has a nice look about it. Not that I, you know, it's going to be a girlfriend or anything, but you know, let's make it appealing looking. I mean, I'll dress like this. Be so, what's this, you know? And they'll open the door and we'll talk to them about orthodoxy and we'll give them a booklet if they want it. But at least we'll talk to them and we'll tell them about the church. Do that. Do that. You will get persecuted. You will get negativity. I guarantee you. They're cowards. They'll give all the religious reasons not to do it. This is not the place. People are not ready for this. People are scared. You'll get every excuse in a book because those people are cowards. You have to resist it. You have to persist. You have to have fortitude. Say, no, we must do this so orthodoxy is no longer the best kept secret. Right. Let's not make it the best kept secret anymore, please. But you have to be persistent. You will get resistance. I guarantee you. It may even be from your priest. 
<laughs> I had one priest who saw me on the street. He says, don't you dare do this anywhere near my church. Pull up the cross. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Look, we're living in a world where the church is divine and human. There's a human component to it where Christ is the head of the church and the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is able to call down the Holy Spirit on the elements to turn the body and to turn the bread and wine into the body and blood. That's the divine element. But then the human element kicks in. Not perfect. So we have a perfection of the divinity and Holy Communion, which we're not going to get in any other church or any other entity, religious entity, only in the Orthodox Church. You're going to get this. But then you have the human, the human part. And if you study church history, you will see the human part. It's not so hot. Hmm. <laughs> no. Um, Rashid Lewis, one, sends in 499. Thank you for that. There's no comment. And by the way, I'm going to be splitting these super chats with Brother Nathaniel. We need to get him set up in a studio. Uh you know, he's got to he's got to raise the money to get this set up. We want to hear more from Brother Nathaniel. I want to hear Bible. Well, you'll hear everything. I mean, that culture will be changed forever, forever. I guarantee you. I'm the one who can do it. I feel this is my moment. After I had the Alex Jones show, I was right. very well received. And Alex really told the producer, okay, who's Russian Orthodox, actually, amazingly enough. Okay, oh, I like this guy. I want to have him back on. And yeah, I'm sure he will. There's certainly and Stu Peters is having me on, on Monday, the Stu Peters Network. I'm going to be on Monday to critique or to explain the interview between Tucker Carlson and my brother in Christ, Vladimir Putin, a very devout Orthodox Christian. And I want to point out to people who may be doubters. My bishop was recently in Balaam, where Putin has his confessor, the monastery. That's his confessor there, the abbot there, the agumen. Okay. And he saw him in church pressing his head on the icons. He would go up to venerate the icons. He would press his head on it. You don't fake that. You can go up and you're in. Okay. But right. to press your head on the icon for seven seconds, that's a believer. He's, he's leaving a prayer is what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing, but uh, I don't know if he's praying because what we do with icons, the the grace that pours forth from the icon, the divinization of creation, the divinization of the material, okay, which is what happened to the Virgin Mary, okay, and which is what happens to us in the Orthodox Church. The deification comes through the icon. You don't even have to pray. Mm. It just comes through. It's called transfer of grace. Mm. That's what can happen with a true yarrant, so with a yaranda. A yarn that can transfer grace just by looking at him. There's a story about St. Anthony. The great. Okay, St. Anthony, the, the first great monastic. All right. Egyptian. Dark. He wasn't white. Okay, he was dark. All right. In the fourth century, he would have people come to him after he did his ascetical uh, um uh, exercises, if you want to call it, asceticism, for 15 years, you'd have young people come to him who were interested in monasticism and just want to talk to him. So there's 15 of them, and uh, he's giving a little talk, and then they ask him questions. And this one's asking this, this one's asking that, and he answers, and one of them, not answering, not asking anything, just, just staring. So St. Anthony says to him, you have no questions? The young man says, no, I just want to look at you. That's orthodoxy. That's not a cookie cutter. Because there's a transfer of grace that all this asceticism that St. Anthony did for so long is interior. And what's inside will come out. St. John Chrysostom says this, not me. Because if I say it, I'll get hit and persecuted and stoned. But if I have to quote who says it, then I'm off the hook a little bit, maybe. This is orthodoxy. 
-huh. That that boy said, I have no questions. I just want to look at you. Yeah. This is See, transfer of grace. Yeah. Where what's divine inside of a holy man could be transferred to another person. And he could feel it and get it. Yep. Wow. Yeah. All you have to do yeah. is look on the this holy person. Exciting. This is exciting. Yes. This is I've the best kept secret that we have to get out. I've and seen a few holy I, people. I a Daniel show, my studio can do that. I need the help. That's why we need to get you up and running. Um, so right. I hope everyone will support you. And then uh, next question from Black Ortho Acolyte again. Thank you. $5. And he asks, I used to suggest door to door. <laughs> people acted like I was insane and said that was only for Protestants. Oh, get, God. You have to save yourself lecture. This is why our churches are empty. Okay. Yeah. I had the same feel. Okay. I mean, I, I've been through it. Been there. Had it happen to me. Oh, this is a Protestant thing to go out and evangelize. Oh, I didn't know St. Paul was, an event. It was a Protestant. Was he Baptist or Methodist? Presbyterian, perhaps? Hmm? Maybe he was the Church of the Nazarene. Maybe that's a little closer. Well, of course, St. Paul. Well, no, forget him. Uh, how about uh, St. Herman of Alaska? He must have been with the First Baptist Church of Anchorage. Because he went out and left the monastery to evangelize. Go door to door. He was a Baptist, for sure. Oh, what about St. Cosmos of Ayatollah? He left as big manual. He was there for 15 years. He went out and got a big cross, put it down, started preaching. Definitely a Protestant. There's no question about it. St. Cosmos of Ayatollah, we go because his icons, we read him every year, we commemorate him. He was absolutely a Methodist. He was a disciple of John and Charles Wesley. No question about it. Because he had a method. A brand, a merchandising. Big cross. He was a Methodist. And he decided he was not going to be saving himself anymore. Oh, you can't do that. I know where you're at and I feel for you. But you've got to tough it out. Where there's a will, there's a way. And that's not in the Bible. I don't care. It's true. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Next question from Peter Traj, I, I think, he, again. And he sends, I think, Australian $5, looks like. Uh, was, thank you for uh, the super chat, was Judaism practiced differently at the time of Jesus as compared to today? Absolutely. How could it not be? They had a temple worship. They had a priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. Absolutely. Judaism today and Judaism after the destruction of the temple is not biblical. It's rabbinical. There was no rabbis. We didn't have rabbis. We had the Aaronic priesthood and their helpers who were Levitical and the scribes who were part of the priesthood. You had the temple worship. And even during this transition period, you have the apostles still going to the temple, and even St. Paul. That was a religion of the Old Testament. You want to call it Judaism? Fine. I call it the Hebraic religion that led up to the New Covenant. So when people say, I keep the Old Testament, I said, you can't. A, a lot of Baptists have gone into this thing. Let's get back to our Jewish roots. They're not Jewish. They never can be. And they can never keep the Mosaic law because they can't get a lamb and bring it to a priest. The Aaronic priesthood is extinct. Hmm. And if you say you're from the Aaronic priesthood in the days of Ezra, Ezra say, would say, let me see your pedigree. In other words, let me see your genealogy. Let me see who you're descended from a history from this one, this one, this one that goes back to Aaron. If they couldn't show it, Aaron, Ezra said, you're out of here. No, of course not. Can't be. Fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating, but actually it's really, it's Bible 101. <laughs> That's why I'm just amazed that, uh, that we don't know these things because right. we're not being taught in the church. That's the crisis. We're just not being taught. We're giving a nice story. They're anecdotal. This one happened to me. That one said that to me and let us do this. Let us do this. It's moralistic and it's a drag, really. You know, sometimes if I want to hear a good sermon, I turn on uh, uh, the Internet and listen to a black preacher because those black preachers know the Bible. 
Mm-hmm. They know the Bible. They know the Old Testament. They can, they can quote whole passages from Numbers, from Leviticus. I'm amazed at some of these black preachers. And they preach it. It's powerful. But they miss, they don't have the Holy Communion. I would say I started reaching out to the black preachers on uh, Bible with Brother. Because I know the issues they have. The same ones come up for the altar call every week. Same ones. They sin, and they repent, and they go right back to the sin. So I started reaching out to some of these black preachers. You have to become orthodox because that can solve this problem. But then I got banned. So right. let's see what God right. has. The studio, the Brother Nathaniel show. That's the answer. I don't think Twitter is going to be it. I don't think so. Uh, next question, also from Peter Trosh. Thank you, Australian five dollars. Which Jewish faction practiced blood libel in early history? Speak of Simon of Trent. Spe- speak to Sp- Simon of Trent specifically. Well, there was only one faction. It was uh, Talmudic Judaism. They're the ones. There wasn't divided into Reform, Conservative, um, Orthodox, and Has- Hasidim. You didn't have those four branches. No. Because the Hasidim didn't come until the 14th, 15th century under the Baal Shem Tov. And then the three groups, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, didn't come until the 19th century, mostly through the uh, immigration of the Jews into America, which I, I know all about because uh, I studied as a kid. And my grandmother was from Austria and my grandmother was from Russia. So we, we kind of understood the, the immigration, the, the historical. I'll tell you something interesting. A priest, very modernistic, very long robe, probably the longest robe I ever saw in my life. Uh, I got in this conversation with him, which I regret, and talking about my Jewish background. And I said, well, you know, uh, the immigration is fascinating because it was the German and Austrian Jews who came to America first in the mid-1800s. They were very cultured. They were very refined, artistic. They knew music. They knew literature. They had a high intellect. They were professional people. And then later, the Eastern European Jews came in, in the Russian Jews at the turn of the century. And my grandmother and all her friends in and, and that side of the family looked down on them because they saw them as crass, uneducated, illiterate, ill-mannered. They looked down on them. They didn't have the high refinement of the German Jew, the Austrian Jew, who were raised, you know, in Beethoven, Brahms, Wagner, okay? So this priest says, what does this have to do with orthodoxy? I said, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Do you ever eat scrambled eggs? He says, yes. What does that have to do with orthodoxy? He wasn't ready for that kind of answer. Okay, so he walks away, and there's a young man next to me. He's like astounded. Why would he say such a thing? I said, let me tell you something. This man with a long robe and the whole thing, the pectoral cross, ah, ooh, look at me. I'm sure he subscribes to the essence of orthodoxy, which is the dogma of the incarnation, that Jesus Christ is fully divine and fully human. I know he subscribes to that. Maybe he preaches it once in a while. But as soon as I'm 1% human, he's scandalized. This is a problem. This is a crisis in the Orthodox Church. And now we're coming to it organically. We can read about Jesus, but are we really entering into his life? If we are, then we must enter into his humanity. Please. Who touched me? That's his humanity. He could not be hid. He tried to hide. That's his humanity. Because of course in his divinity, he can hide. Of course in his divinity, he can't be touched. But we don't see these things. We don't see his humanity. We don't see when the woman came to him, a Syrophoenician woman. She wasn't Jewish. My daughter has has a devil. Could you come and heal her? It's not right to take the children's bread and take it and cast it to the dogs. Well, that was kind of harsh. That was rude. That was very rude for Jesus to say that. 
kind of human, I would think. She says, yet, Lord. <laughs> I saw this when I first read it as a Jewish kid. I loved it. I said, this is so Jewish. Yet, Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. Did Jesus say, great is your faith? He didn't. He said, for this saying, for the way you answered me, she's healed. I said, this guy's incredible. But we don't see this anymore. We're missing it. We don't, we're, we don't have Jesus anymore in the church. We have a list of dogmas. We have a list of how to do this, how to do that. There's another thing about Metropolitan Laria. Okay, there's a certain part of the service where some people said you have to kneel. Some people said, no, you can stand. They go up to Laria, which is the orthodox thing to do, Metropolitan. Is it right to kneel during this time, the service, or is it orthodox to stand up? He says, you know, they're both right. <laughs> oh, I just miss him. I miss him. If you're watching right now, please uh, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel if you aren't already, because that's just what people do. Next question is from Peter again, another $5 Australian, who says, which Jews specifically strayed from God and made child sacrifice to Moloch? Most of them in the Bible, in the Old Testament, most of them. That's why God said to Elijah, you're not the only one. Elijah is uh, kvetching. Oh, Elihu, we call him. In Judaism, Elihu, oh, I'm the only one. They want to kill me. They're killing everybody else. Not right after me. And I'm the only one standing up for you. And God says, no, you're not the only one. The 7,000 are preserved. It's called the remnants. But the rest of them were sacrificing to Moloch. And the king in that day and Jezebel were sacrificing their children to Moloch. And many of the Israelites were doing that. So in the history of Judaism, and the history of uh, the Jewish people, it's not so hot. You take the law of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu, first of all, he wasn't a rabbi, he was a priest. Okay, he was not a rabbi. But you have to exalt the rabbinic office. So Moshe Rabbeinu, I studied with the Chabad. With, okay, so at any rate, you have the law of Moses. Well, one of the laws is do not put a log in front of a blind person. That's a law of Moses. Who needs this kind of law? A very wicked kind of person. But he gave it to the whole people. There's another law, a mosaic. Moshe Rabbeinu, the great law is exalted. Do not curse a deaf man. Who needs that kind of law? A human being? There's another one. Don't watch your mother and father having sex. Don't put a candle while... <laughs> hmm. See, people don't, don't read. They don't, don't see what's going on here. We saw this. Uh, we were Some of us, we were young. We saw it because we studied Torah. Torah is actually not Talmud. It's called Torah by the Hasids. Torah is the five books of Moses. We saw this. This is a law of Moses. Did uh, Hammurabi's law have that? No. The Babylon, Babylonians, the people of Babylon were better people than the Jews. He didn't codify, don't put a don't curse a deaf man. <laughs> Next question is from Heidi E. B., who sends Hi, a fat. Heidi. She sends a fat super chat, $49.99. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, there's no question attached, but we appreciate the donation. These donations are going to be split with Brother Nathaniel. We're going to try to help him get his studio up and running so we can hear more uh, lessons from the Bible from him. As you guys are all hearing now, he knows it very well. And, uh, and again from Peter Traj, another Australian $5. Uh, speak to the claim that Ashkenazi Jews are sons of Gomer from the line of Japheth and therefore not of Shem. All right. <laughs> okay, so you have Ashkenazi and you have um, Sephardim. The Ashkenazi are the diaspora that went up into uh, Russia and Europe, Eastern and Western Europe. And 
Iran or Persia, okay? The Sephardim went west, Spain, uh, and later into Morocco, and many of the Israelis today are Sephardim, and they're Lukuniks, they're very right-wing, okay? But historically, they weren't, okay? But we have to look at different parts of history. I'm just trying to bring it up to date a little bit. So Ashkenazi or Jews are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. They're not from Japheth. Japheth is... Um, the uh, white European, Indo-European, that's j -Pass. The Shemites were not only the Jews, they were the, the Arab people. And, and the, the, uh, the Hamites, the descendant from Noah had three sons, the Hamites uh, could probably include uh, a whole group of people, Chinese people, probably the Iranian people. Then they took on different uh, dialects, different Spatial features. This is the result of the Tower of Babel. People say, "What are different colors? Why does someone have a big nose? Why does someone have a little nose? Why does somebody have that tainted skin?" Well, that God did that at the Tower of Babel. Not only did He divide the languages, He divided the uh, racial characteristics at the Tower of Babel. But you have to study Patristics to know this. You're not going to see it in the Bible. You have to have the Church Fathers, Patristics, to know these things. And I've studied them pretty well. I know them pretty good. But wasn't the uh, the flood after the was it before or after the the Tower of Babel? Tower of Babel came after the flood. Oh, okay, right. Okay, uh, I think that we have all all of the questions have been answered. So um, I would like to give you one more. Uh, Question, would you please tell us where we can find you, where we can follow you uh, nowadays? Okay, I'm at, at Real Bro Nat on X, as Elon Musk calls it now, Twitter. And I'm also at Real Jew News, where I talk about the political aspects of things. I just did uh, a little... Uh, Expose, so to speak, of uh, the Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin, and I extracted the Orthodox kernel out of that because Vladimir Putin did refer to Russia as being Orthodox mm. throughout the interview. Yes, he did, historically and contemporarily today. So I extracted that. So that's on my site, Real Jew News. I'm also on Rumble. It's kind of new, but Rumble seems to be the up and coming, and it's called the Brother Nathaniel Show. Getting ready for the studio. Yeah, and I have uh, I, I have all those links, most of those links below in the description, so people can go and find him and follow him. Uh, we got up to over two hundred viewers live, which is by smashes any record I've had before previously by far this is let's do it again daniel i hope oh. youtube keeps you on <laughs> yeah i'm glad to hear that from you um we will most certainly so, we work well thank, together yes uh thank you brother nathaniel for coming on that's our show for the evening everybody and uh we'll see you all next time good night good night